Keep an eye out for that. Uh, and again, thank you so much for, for coming today. Uh, I am passing you on to Logan, the uh, education officer for Imperial Food Society, who's going to introduce himself. Um, hello. Um, let me just check. That. Okay. Uh, I'm Logan. I'm the education lecturers officer for Imperial. Um, I thank you for coming today to our second day of the conference. Um, I'm really excited to see the next four talks um, by all four universities. Um, a big thank you again for the committee, the, the committees of all universities for organizing this. It took a lot of effort and it's been um, quite a long journey. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy the day. I'll pass it on to Amelia. Hi, I'm the president for Oxford University Physics Society. Um, yesterday was our first um, time participating in this conference and I think it was a really great experience. It was great to see so many audience members so um, so interested in these topics and great to hear from some really great speakers. So I'm really looking forward to um, the second day of the conference um, and looking forward to hopefully participating again in the future. Um, now Zara is also has some things to introduce. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Zara, and I'm one of the academic officers for the UCL Physics Society. And today I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Matthew Wing, who will start off today's uh, series of lectures. And Professor Matthew Wing is a particle physicist and will be talking about how new accelerator technologies will enable searches for dark photons and investigation of QCD. Before we begin, I'd also like to remind you to please turn your cameras on if you're able to do so. And also, if you have any remaining questions after the talk, please remember to join our workspace Slack, um, where our speakers will be able to answer your questions. Also, if you have any questions throughout the lecture, please just type them into the chat box and they'll be addressed during the Q&A session after the talk. Um, so, Professor Wing, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, I will share my uh, slides. And yeah, you should be able to see, I'll put them into full screen. Is that okay? Okay, so thanks very much for that introduction and for organizing this conference. I joined um, some of it yesterday evening. It was uh, a great start. So I hope we can, I can continue with the um, interest uh, as well. So I am going to talk about new accelerator technology to enable searches for dark photons and investigation of QCD. So this maybe is a little uh, different to what's been done before in that we're really addressing a new kind of accelerator technology to try and make um, particle accelerators of the future either shorter or of higher, en higher energy. And then some I'll then address some of the applications of this to high energy physics experiments. Um, as mentioned in the title. So let's move on to um, an introduction and a motivation. So for our, starting from a particle physics perspective, um, there are many big questions in particle physics. We know that the standard model is an amazingly successful theory. We've, we'll hear about it in other talks, but also we think there's something perhaps beyond the standard model. And there are a number of unanswered questions. Um, there's the understanding of the Higgs boson in, in great detail, which we heard about its discovery, but then is all the un really deep understanding um, of its properties. There's neutrinos and their masses. So I think this is um, something to be addressed in, a, uh, in another talk and something I won't discuss here, but is also a big open question. And then um, some other questions that you could ask is why is there so much matter versus antimatter? We know that around us is generally matter. We don't see much antimatter because we don't just spontaneously uh, change into energy. Um, and why is there then so little matter? Why is it only 5% of the universe? And what is dark matter or dark energy? And why are the three families? Um, can we unify the forces? And what is the fundamental structure matter? So there's lots and lots of questions still remaining. And I say that high energy, high energy particle colliders or experiments have been instrumental um, and key to sol uh, will be key to solving some of these questions. And then looking at it from a, um, uh, accelerator perspective rather than just a high energy physics, particle physics perspective. So, as I said, the use of these large accelerators has been crucial in advance of particle physics. So, here we've got a, a plot of the center of mass energy, so the amount of energy in the collisions that happen, versus the year of physics going back from the 60s 
all the way up to um, the 2000s when the last big uh, particle acceleration in HC was, um, was built. So you can see that this is split into two, either hadron colliders, which there have been fewer, and then there's been lots of E plus E minus uh, electron positron colliders over the years. And you can see on this logarithmic scale, you've got this roughly um, linear increase um, such that the energy was going up pretty rapidly um, year by year, where you started off in the um, 60s with a 1 GV center of mass energy electron positron collider and went up to 200 GV, the um, LEP2 collider in the top right hand um, of the plot. And you can also see, I've just highlighted a few things that were discovered as was, as, uh, by these colliders going along, like the gluon discovered at the, in the late 70s, early 80s, um, at the Daisy Pitcock Pit Collider, the W and Zs at CERN, the, the top quark at the Tevatron. Also, uh, not necessarily the discovery of new particles, but really fundamental issues like saying that the number of neutrino families was three, was discovered um, at the LEP Collider. But then if you look at um, the LA, if you put the LHC on here, it was done, this plot was made before the LHC actually turned on. You can see that it's actually over here was actually shifted along because it actually turned on a bit later. And this doesn't really fit on this then continuing uh, growth or this continuing line. If in the future we have a, an E plus E minus co linear collider, then also this is gonna be somewhere in the future, it's gonna be some energy, maybe 500 to a TV. And it's certainly not, um, certainly not continuing along this, this line here. So part of the problem is getting to these very high energy frontier colliders is that they're very large and very expensive, of course. And so the question is, is can we use new technologies? So the basic technology that's used is that you have radio frequency cavities, which apply a sort of like a, a plus and minus um, voltage across, uh, across a given cavity and accelerates particles to, uh, to high energies. However, this is then limited to something like about 100 megavolts per meter. So, you know, you get 100, a particle would accelerate from zero to 100 mega electron volts in a meter. So to, you can work it out that you're then talking about kilometer lengths uh, or even tens of kilometers to get up to the interesting kind of TEV scales. So this shows some indication of saturation. And the question is then, can we um, look at something different? So maybe before we look at something different, just to say that conventional accelerators are limited or how they work, it's that circular colliders, they have many magnets with few cavities, but you have strong uh, magnetic fields. Some of the, adva um, the advantage of this is if you have something like protons, you can get to the very high energy of the Large Hadron Collider. If you have electrons and positrons, you suffer from high synchron radi radiation. Another advantage is that you have a high repetition rate because you have a bunch going around and colliding with the other bunch, then they go around again and collide again. So you have a, um, a high luminosity, a high number of interactions per second. If you consider linear colliders, which is another way of having a, um, a high energy frontier collider, you have fewer magnets, but many cavities. So you need to have um, very efficient um, power production. Here you also have is that the electrons and positrons come together, collide, and then they pass off and they can't be used again because they're not in a circular machine where they can come back um, and uh, collide again. So this single pass means that you need very, very small beams to get the high luminosity that uh, you acquire to look at physics at the very highest um, energies. And here then the higher the gradient, the shorter the linux. So if you've got this 100 megavolts per meter as an absolute limit, that dictates then how long these um, future collides will be. And we're talking the order of tens of kilometers. So I'm gonna talk about plasma weight field acceleration as a solution to um, having a technique to realize shorter or higher energy accelerators in particle physics. I'll explain this a little bit more in detail, but just to give some overarching kind of um, headlines about it is that the accelerating gradients achieved in the Wakefield plasma are potentially very high. And indeed, measurements to be made of gradients are 100 gigavolts per meter. So we should contrast that with what a classical accelerator can do of a maximum of 100 megavolts per meter. So it's three, order, three orders of magnitude, uh, magnitude higher. However, of course, this one, if you like that headline achievement is, is one part of it, but you also need that the beam has a small energy spread. You need this high repetition rate and high number of particles per bunch. You want, of course, it to be efficient and highly reproducible and you want um, small uh, beam sizes. So what we're going to consider here is that, so this has been looked at um, using, um, 
using lasers, lasers or electron beams to drive these uh, wake fields, which I'll explain in a minute. But what we're going to consider is using protons to try and get this kind of TEV scale in, on the order of at most a few kilometers rather than tens of kilometers that uh, a current accelerator would, would need to do. So let me explain plasma wave acceleration um, uh, initially. So this shows a very simplified cartoon in which you have a, a neutral plasma. This could be some, uh, some rubid, rubidium vapor, for example, or um, argon, um, argon um, some, some particular element. And you then need to ionize it so that you've got the free electrons and um, the ions within the plasma. And you have a beam coming in, so a short proton beam comes in. And because this is very intense, this attracts the free electrons within the plasma, attracts it to the, the proton beam. They accelerate towards it to meet it. Um, they then sort of reach their maximum acceleration on the axis of the proton beam. So they come in and then they fly past and go away and you know, uh, go past, past the axis of the proton beam. And then what's happened is that these ions, the ions so relatively stable and still, they have remained where they are and attract the electrons back again. And this kind of oscillating, if you like, movement of uh, electrons within the plasma creates up very strong electric fields. And so what you get is this kind of like regions uh, shown here as blue of high positive charge density where there are the ions, initially the proton uh, beam, but then the ions within the plasma and regions of high negative charge density, the uh, electrons that are moving um, within the plasma. And so you get these very strong electric fields which are going in this direction. And if you then inject around where this yellow arrow is, around here, if you can see my mouse, if you, if you inject another bunch of electrons in there, they will be accelerated up to high energies because they'll feel this um, accelerating force and they can be um, accelerated using these um, strong, uh, uh, strong fields. So just, uh, there's a few formulae here, but um, they're actually uh, so, sort of simplified formula to give you an idea of uh, what, you need to, what you need to do. So this, that bubble-like structure that I showed you is characterized then by the, the plasma wavelength. So the, uh, the length of these bubbles is uh, given by the plasma wavelength, which is related to the density um, of the plasma. And that's shown here, that the plasma wavelength or frequency is related to the plasma density, this um, NP. And then the uh, of more in kind of like crucial importance is this accelerating gradient. So the actual the size of the electric fields, if you like. So this can be then in gigavolts per meter. This is really the area we're interested in because that's then significant, significantly higher than the limit from conventional accelerators. Um, and this is related to within, within this, this short proton bunch that goes in, it's related to the number of protons in that bunch. So if you have 10 to the 10, this ratio is one and a very short uh, bunch. So if your bunch length is about 100 microns and this ratio would be one, and so you'll have two gigavolts per meter. Or in other words, what you'd, like to have, what you'd like to see is very short drive beams or drive beams with large numbers of particles. Okay, so I'll discuss then um, how we're doing this in a little bit more detail about using a proton bunch to drive plasmas and the um, awake experiments. Before I do that, I just want to show you a, um, a result from a paper from 2007 in which they used electron bunches going into the wake field to drive these, again into the plasma to drive these strong wake fields. So the mechanism works the same way. Um, the protons, of course, are highly positively charged and initially attracted the free electrons. These, um, the electron bunch going in initially um, uh, repels the plasma electrons and then of course they get attracted back but this mechanism is um, essentially the same. So they injected um, 42 GV, so electrons at 42 GV and roughly doubled the energy to 80 GV in about one meter. So that tells you that you're looking at gradients of something like 50 gigavolts per meter. So of course if that were true then that would suggest that, oh, you could build a, a, future, a future energy frontier facil facility in maybe tens of meters. Um, I should say that it's not quite as simple as that because actually what's happening here is that a bunch is being injected and the head of the bunch is creating this disturbance and creating these wake fields. And the rear of the bunch is being accelerated up to, uh, to, high, to high energies. And so actually, if you look at this graph down below, this shows you 
that some fraction of the bunch was accelerated up to say 80 GB, so the energy was doubled. So um, this is clearly a very interesting effect, but it's not actually useful, say, as a, uh, a particle accelerator. Um, work is going on in the uh, roughly the uh, sort of like same place or same project uh, to use electrons to try actually do it, in which they have two bunches where they have a, one bunch driving the weight field, another bunch being accelerated up, and that's work that's um, ongoing in Stanford at the moment. Although I won't uh, talk about it here. So why we want to use protons is because lasers or all of these or electrons actually have a limited amount of energy, and so. We're talking about lasers, even though they're very high powered and laser technology has moved on greatly recently, they only still have the order of say a joule or 10 joules of energy. And so at some point going through a plasma, they start to become, start to disperse and start to be ineffective at driving weight fields. Whereas protons, at least uh, there are protons that exist say at CERN or in um, American uh, laboratories, which are very high energy. And these in principle then have uh, have a higher stored amount of energy rather than say the order of joules or ten joules. We're talking about kilojoules, and these things can tra uh, travel through a plasma over um, tens of meters, hundreds of meters, and potentially even kilometers. And so you can do this whole acceleration process, as is shown on this picture here, in one stage rather than the uh, multiple stages um, shown for a, either a laser or electron driver. So this whole idea of using protons was first postulated in this paper in 2009, um, which is referenced on the bottom right, which gave birth to this kind of whole area of research and um, the AWAKE experiment. So on the top left here is a plot which shows you a simulation of pretty much what that cartoon I showed at the beginning was uh, trying to get across, and that you've got this red simulated short proton bunch creating this bubble-like structure of regions of high negative and positive charge. And this little small black spot here is a small bunch of electrons which have been put into the wake field and then accelerated up. And here you can see that the simulations tell us that you can get 500 GeV in about 300 meters. And um, any other reasonable design for a, based on conventional technology would tell you that to get 500 GeV wouldn't take you 300 meters, but it would take you something like about 10 kilometers. Um, so that's a tremendous improvement if the technique works, and that's why we're uh, embarking on experimental um, work to see if that actually really works. One thing we should note, though, is that the bunch length, I told you that you need short bunches, and 100 microns was uh, a kind of good number for driving strong weight, weight fields. However, the bunches at CERN from the LHC or the pre-accelerators are more like about 10 centimeters. So that's uh, an immediate challenge in that they're much much longer. So to get, uh, to get around this, we actually use a, um, uh, a kind of effect in the plasma that actually creates micro bunches out of this very long proton bunch. So I said that it's more like 10 centimeters rather than 100 microns. And what happens is this thing goes into the, plas into the plasma and then um, some of it gets expelled transversely and some of it gets focused um, into, into a certain, in certain regions, creating small micro bunches. And these micro bunches are then spaced at the pl plasma wavelength. Each one of them creates a small wake field, but then reinforce the, those behind it, reinforce it. And so you essentially get constructive interference with the wake field. Also, because they're um, more compact, more tightly focused, they create uh, slightly large, they create larger wake fields than, um, than if you just split up the bunch uh, just equally. And so actually what you end up is that these small micro bunches provide then very, str um, very strong wake fields of the orders of gigavolts per meter that, were, um, that we were hoping to see. So this is then what we do, or we're, we investigated at the AWAKE, the AWAKE experiment to see if this actually really works. So the AWAKE experiment at CERN, this um, shows you on the left, the CERN accelerator complex and the LHC, which you've heard a lot about yesterday, is this 27 kilometer ring. Before that, the protons are accelerated in various channels to get it up to that uh, highest energy for the LHC. And the accelerator just before the LHC is called the SPS, which is where the protons go up to about 400 GeV before they go into the LHC. They also go off to do many other experiments as well. And one of them is as shown on this red line here, the AWAKE experiment. And here we use 400 GeV protons to try and investigate um, uh, the effects I've just been talking about in a 
an experimental area shown here about 100 meters, uh, 100 meters underground. Okay, so this is now a, uh, a schematic of what actually the awake experiment looks like. So you've got this red here, this red proton beam, which uh, is from the SPS that I mentioned. It is merged with a laser here. This laser is needed to ionize the, the, the plasma, to create it into a plasma. It goes here. You've got this other uh, electron bunch here, which is then behind the proton bunch, which we want to accelerate up to high energies. So the proton and the laser go into the um, go into the plasma. And here, there's some schematics shown on the bottom as well of kind of again these cartoons of having this long proton bunch to get split up into these micro bunches. You inject electrons into the right phase within the um, within the uh, kind of like micro bunch system, and they get accelerated up over this 10 meters of plasma. We then have some various diagnostics to, uh, to determine this. Some diagnostics look at the proton bunch and a diagnostic here to look at the, um, ele uh, the accelerated electrons. And I'll discuss that in a bit more detail. So actually, how do we see them? We actually then measure the protons as they come out of the plasma, either with the plasma on or off, and you see that actually when the plasma is on, the proton bunches have grown transversely. And that indicates that some of it is being expelled, as I said and showed you in that cartoon. We actually have another way of measuring them and actually try and measure the longitudinal profile. And this actually shows you that this, rather than this being some kind of just um, kind of like uniform uh, bunch of pro protons, you see that actually you're getting some bunch-like structure coming up. And that shows you that we're actually, we actually are modulating these. What we also see is that this is reproducible. The um, spacing between the bunches is, um, as we expected, related to the wavelength of the plasma. And the reproducibility of it is crucial for the injection of then electrons. Because of course, if this moves about all over the place, then we just don't know where to inject the electrons because they have to be injected in a certain place to be able to feel the acceleration, uh, acceleration forces. Okay, so just to show you one thing here, which is the, um, the way that we measure electrons. If you look, uh, I'm showing this just because we at UCL built this um, part, of the, part of the experiment, the um, spectrometer. So if you look at the top right, which is a, um, a, a computer model, then you see that there's this green, uh, green device here, which is a dipole magnet, which splits the electrons away from the protons. It also gives the electrons a, um, a spread so that we can measure their energy by measuring their position. So they impinge then on a scintillator screen and then we, we measure the scintillation light in a camera that's positioned 17 meters away. And so we have to guide the light using very fancy shiny mirrors to uh, get the light from the scintillator screen to the camera. And here on the bottom of this photo is actually then a picture where this kind of like um, rectangular with semi circular edges is the scintillation screen. This is not actually scintillation light. That's actually just a calibration lamp. Um, we don't see anything that bright that's coming out. But we do see then that this scintillation screen uh, uh, becomes very bright and that's what we measure to know um, that we see electrons. So actually seeing this um, in a real event, if you like, is shown here where this one meter by six centimeter screen is shown on the top here. You can see that it's one meter long and six centimeters high. And then we see here this bunch of um, this bunch of light, if you like, which we then convert into a signal for electrons. And here we've then got a signal for electrons. You can see it's a nice clean peak. Uh, the background is uh, we've taken away and we can see um, a nice clean um, signal. So that tells us that we can modulate the proton bunch as we saw before, we can inject the electrons and we can accelerate them up to um, certain energies. Actually, so far what we've done is we've achieved um, a, an acceleration up to 2 GeV, which is shown here in the top right-hand um, point. So this shows you the actual mean energy versus a different plasma density. And we got up to 2 GeV. So 2 GeV within um, at most 10 meters is only 200 megavolts per meter, which isn't that much more than an RF acceleration, but um, it's still, it is more. Uh, also, it's maybe not optimized yet, and we think that we should be able to stabilize and have gigavolt per meter um, gradients in the future. Also, the injection of the electrons, you know, they weren't, didn't start the acceleration as soon as they entered, so the 10 meters is, is some upper limit. But this shows us that um, 
that we that the essential method works. Now we're working on um, improving that. So we're starting on a new um, series of experimentation to accelerate them to higher energies, um, to demonstrate beam quality and to demonstrate the scalability of the, the whole whole system, such that if we can de uh, demonstrate 10 GeV electrons in 10 meters, then we should have 20 GeV in 20 meters and 200 GeV in 200 meters, etc. So I think that what we're looking at here is that we're trying to apply the technology to high energy physics. There's other you know, applications for accelerators, but we're really concentrating on high energy physics. I think the pure energy gain looks possible. Uh, having a high bunch charge looks possible. So the demonstrating or maintaining the beam quality, this is important, needs to be demonstrated. So i.e. if you've got a small bunch that's going in, uh, a small precise bunch, you have a nice precise bunch coming out. A big issue is the repetition, repetition frequencies. How many times can you put, um, uh, can you do this acceleration process per second? Because, you know, at the LHC, it happens uh, at 40 megahertz, isn't it? So it's like 40 million times a second. Another, even the um, future linear glider is meant to be something like 20 kilohertz. So I think it's ambitious to build a high energy, high luminosity E plus E minus collider as the first application, but we've been thinking about other applications which uh, uh, have high, high energy and lower luminosity. And so I'll come on now to the, some of the um, physics possibilities. So the search for dark photons. Um, so dark, the hidden or dark photons are a way of explaining dark matter. Um, so there are many ways being looked for dark matter, like at the LHC, which we heard about, um, probably you'll hear about uh, Maybe the second talk yesterday was also talking about uh, direct detection of dark uh, dark matter. And here, this is looking for light kind of uh, GV and below type particles that could be um, an explanation for dark matter and maybe other phenomena as well. So these dark photons are coupled potentially here to a, a photon, and they are, if you like, so there is a photon and a dark photon, and then. This would then reveal a whole hidden sector, which could then be, uh, as the same explanation for dark matter. So they, these kind of couple with some very weak strength. Obviously, the the strength must be quite weak; otherwise, we'd have probably seen them already. And this is a growing area of interest to look for these kind of um, these kind of particles because there's there's regions that haven't been searched for, and uh, they could explain uh, many things. So. There are several ways to do that. You could look at a E plus D minus collision, a dark photon could, could be produced and then it could decay, and then you could reconstruct um, an invariant mass. You can also look at it by firing it into a target and looking for what comes out at the end. It's almost like a, a light shining through a wall type of experiment. So in a way, what, what you do is you, shire, you fire an electron beam into a very long target, such that you expect nothing to come out to the other end. There's no uh, beam background, so standard model process that could come out. But if something does come out, it indicates that actually probably this was some um, exotic process like a dark photon. And you know, the dark photon could be produced in which it say decays to an electron positron or it decays to some other, uh, other dark matter type particle. So I won't say too much about this, but there's an experiment going on at CERN, which we, in a way uh, we want to compare to is that the NA64 experiment uses a high energy electron beam, but is very limited in the number of electrons it um, has. And this is the important bit. So they have something like 10 to the 12 electrons on, on target. So they fire 10 to the 12 electrons over a period of time into a target, and they look to see if something comes out the other end. Um, the more electrons you have, you have, the more sensitivity you'll have to, a, uh, to the dark photon processes. So we think that if we're successful with our next few years of the AWAKE project, we will be able to get something like 10 to the 15 electrons, uh, 10 to 15 high energy electrons for a similar amount of running. So three orders of magnitude uh, higher. So it's an effective upgrade of this experiment, increasing the then intensity by a factor of a thousand. How this then looks, if you then want to do a search is shown here. So this is then a plot of that cartoon which is shown before, which shows the coupling between uh, dark photons and uh, real photons versus the mass of a dark photon. The gray areas of what's been searched for already by um, previous experiments. The colors are potential experiments. So the NA64 experiment, which is ongoing, should get up to maybe where this green line is, 10 to the 12, maybe up to 10 to the 13. 
with the awake with the awake technology where we can provide this high energy electron beam with more um, more electrons then this will then extend it up to here with 10 to the 15 or 10 to the 16 electrons so really pushing out into a higher region of the mass um, and covering also a, a wide region in the, the coupling strength if we could uh, accelerate electrons to one TV, then this would give you this blue line here. And that extends way and really covers in this kind of region that's been covered by experiments from above. And sort of here, it really goes right uh, into this region and um, kind of would probably have no other com competitive experiments, competitor experiments that could cover that region. Okay, so maybe just, uh, I think I probably have just about five minutes left to just go through then the final idea of uh, measuring the strong force using a high energy electron proton collider. So this shows you a kind of cartoon of what an electron proton collision looks like in which you have an electron exchanges a photon um, which hits a quark within the proton and that's the basic uh, process that happens in, um, as it's called deep elastic scattering. This quark then had, uh, produces some uh, spray of hadrons and the proton gets broken up. This is kind of characterized by um, the energy scale resolution called Q squared, which is the difference in the four momentum squared of the incoming and outgoing electron. And it's almost like the resolution such that if you look at these cartoons that on the bottom right, the lower Q squared you have, you then just see if you like the three quarks you expect in the proton. The higher Q squared you go, you start to see all of the kind of like soup of interaction that goes on in which there's uh, gluons being radiated, the, um, splitting, other quarks being created. It's just this, um, very um, sort of like vibrant um, soup of uh, particles within the uh, proton. However, the question is, this structure is, it must level out at some point or saturate. And that's something that's not been discovered, but is a very uh, hot topic within understanding the, st the structure of matter. Another question you could ask as well, of course, is, is there further protonic substructure? So are quarks really fundamental? This is also touched on in the first talk yesterday about the real, you know, what are fundamental particles and maybe quarks have some structure as well. And by doing these kind of experiments, you can investigate that. So the idea would be to use the accelerator, awake accelerator technologies that we could get up to something like an electron beam of 3 TeV. This is in which we use the LHC as the proton driver to create the wake fields. And electrons can be accelerated up to these TeV scales, which isn't really possible with any other um, technology. So we'd actually have then a center of mass energy of nine TeV for the electron proton collisions, which is way beyond anything that's done before, a factor of 30 higher than the previous uh, collider, and also um, extends then in the kinematic reach uh, uh, significantly. So I'll present some ideas here. Um, but first, just to show you one other property, of course, is the luminosity. So this shows you a schematic, which is a simple PowerPoint design of a very complicated accelerator system. I told you that the protons are used in a plasma to accelerate electrons, and then they collide with the other protons at the LHC, and you have this electron-proton collision. We're kind of limited by the lumin luminosity or the number of interactions that occur, number of EP interactions occur, and it's relatively low compared to maybe um, other energy frontier colliders. However, there's a lot of physics that can be done at these low luminosities in electron proton physics. Here's actually listed some of them, and I'll go through um, just briefly demonstrating them, um, whether it's looking at uh, the nature of the cross sections and the structure of the proton and the photon. And also very interesting, the relationship between quantum chromodynamics, which describes the strong force of nature and gravity. What's, what, you know, is, there any, is there any deep relation between, relationship between them? So this shows you a plot of looking at the, I told you that the photon, there's a photon emitted by the electron which collides with a proton. And you can just measure how often that occurs. That's the total cross section of photons hitting a proton. These open points are previous data and you can see it goes up to a certain energy. And then what you could do at this new collider, which is uh, using these high energy electrons and protons is shown in these solid points. And you can see that they extend way beyond um, what, you, what we've had before. Um, it's actually equivalent to something like uh, a 20 PeV photon on a fixed target. So actually it's very uh, closely related to cosmic ray physics as well, where you have these really high energy um, interactions. And to give you some idea of kind of like what current models say is, this is what current models say. These, this is just a few of them. There are others which diverge even more, but it should be noted that the, if you like this dash, the dashed line and the dotted line uh, both fit previous data, and that's what they predict happens at higher, 
higher energies. And we also assume that at some point it will have to, again, saturate the cross section can't go to infinity. Another way of looking at this, this is here, where this top set of data points shows you again this total cross section. And then I'm looking at different particles being produced. So the high, high, higher the mass particle, it goes down this graph. And so the higher mass means that they're produced more rarely. However, at some point, given current predictions, you'll see that the higher mass particles become produced more frequently than lower mass particles, which makes no sense. And so really, um, uh, QCD and the strong force can be really better understood and really probed um, in this region um, uh, by a very high energy electron proton collider. This plot shows, uh, I'm careful, being mindful of times, so this plot shows a similar kind of thing. And so I'll just skip that and then got uh, this one last slide before I then summarize. So another thing you can do is if you've got an electron proton collider, then you can look for leptoquarks, which are uh, um, an off muted um, physics beyond the standard model because uh, they're a kind of like a fusion of a lepton, so an electron and a quark. And so you have them produced here directly, if you like on mass shell and they're produced and then, um, uh, then decay and uh, you can measure them. The nice thing about, as I say, the electron proton machine is that they're produced directly and you have sensitivity up to um, uh, right up to the center of mass energy of 9 TeV for these, uh, for these um, uh, leptate quarks. And this takes you well beyond what can be what was done previously. The previous HERA, HERA experiment, the previous EP collider, which went up to um, had sensitivity as shown here and also goes beyond what can be done um, at the LHC. Okay, so then I'll just now um, quickly summarize and say that plasma wakefield acceleration could be a technology of the future for um, particle physics experiments by making, uh, by enabling us to have colliders that are shorter or to go to higher energies. Um, so the Wake collaboration has got a program of R&D, which is looking at developing this um, as a usable accelerated technology. Something I didn't mention, but one could consider a combination of conventional and novel schemes in say designing uh, an upgrade of conventional accelerator, um, but also adding on plasma wave acceleration to give it that boost to higher energy. So we've started to consider also some realistic applications, um, which also have novel and interesting uh, particle physics experiments, such as fixed target beam dump experiments, um, sensitive to dark photons, and then um, an electron proton collider up to the very, uh, very high energies. And I mean, work continues continues on studying these, and um, we'll see what it goes, uh, see what it, uh, where it where it leads us. But overall, I think it's uh, very exciting to have these new kind of um, accelerated techniques to enable uh, new particle physics um, experiments. And with that, I'll um, stop. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're now going to go um, into a Q&A session. So I already see one question in the chat. Um, if you have any questions, use the raise your hand function or type it into the chat. So we have a question from Oishi Banerjee. I'm really sorry. I've probably pronounced your name wrong. Um, who's asking, aren't terahertz accelerators also, sorry, I'm <laughs> just trying to find this, <laughs> the chat. Um, who says, aren't terahertz accelerators also an alternative to the RF particle accelerators? Do you believe that in comparison, plasma wake fields are a better solution? I mean, yeah, so I mean, what I, what, what I was discussing was, um, if you like, one form of novel uh, particle acceleration. So there is the conventional uh, approach of RF accelerators. There are many other approaches, if you like, there's uh, the use of dielectrics, there's of course, um, sometimes if you think maybe accelerating muons is a novel approach as well, rather than uh, accelerating electrons. So there are, there are very many different approaches. This is, is one of them, maybe of all the various novel approaches, it's perhaps the most, um, the most mature. Uh, I mentioned some of the basics of plasma wakefield acceleration. This was first actually proposed in the late 70s. Um, so it's been around for a long time. Um, it was just that in, it was only really uh, took about 20 years before laser technology was such that you could actually start doing the first experiments of plasma, uh, plasma weight field acceleration. So it's, it's really, um, technology had to happen uh, to be able to look at this effect. And now 
what with uh, the possibilities of using lasers as drive beams, electron uh, bunches as drive beams, and proton bunches as drive beams. I just think that this, at the moment, I would say is the um, most likely to maybe lead to uh, to it being actually applied and used in um, in say high energy physics experiments uh, as a as a new technology. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions? Okay, we have a uh, question from Marlene Corner, who says, um, could you take a moment to explain that slide that you skipped? Uh, which one was that? Was it this one? one? Yeah, that one. <laughs> okay. Oh, yes, yeah, so this was in a way just, um, just, so this, this, what this shows is the, we were looking at the total cross section before the first plot I showed here, the total cross section versus, um, for, for which you have a photon, um, a photon exchange. You can also have the, the photon being a, a virtual particle. So it's, so it's almost like it's not a real, it's not, it's not a real photon, but you can look at it, but it's, uh, but it just ex exists for a short amount of time. And you can actually then look at it as a function of the actual cross section as a function of Q squared. So this, if you like this resolution, so this low Q squared means that you are not resolving too much of the proton, but the higher Q squared you go and you start to see more of these kind of interactions. And what you see here is that you've got this, this data that already exists and you've got these two types of um, theories, which are both fitted, if you like, to this data, to these data, describe it well, and then you extend them up to the higher energies that you could get at this new collider, which is given by these solid points. That's what the new collider could do. And you can see that there's two things that, that if you take this, these points here, this, this higher Q squared range, that the red and the blue are miles away from each other, even though they are very good models of what we know about particle physics. But they uh, are just uh, differ um, by, by large factors. So we just don't know what's going on there. Also what happens is that they start, in the case of the blue, they start to cross over, which means that a higher Q squared process a rarer process starts to become more likely than a, than, um, um, than a lower Q-squared process, which doesn't make any physical sense. And so it's really, um, it would be great to be able to make these kind of measurements to really distinguish what is going on and what actually, the, you know, the fundamental structure of the proton, which is, you know, what we consider, if you like, the fundamental structure of matter really looks like. Thank you. We also have a second question. Actually, um, I'm gonna first go through the through questions people's first question. So I'll go back to the other one above um, later, but we have a question from Socrates, Michael, and he says, is the justification to build the FCC sufficient given that it will cost billions with no guarantee that new particles will be found? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. You should maybe, I don't know if you asked that to Professor Butterworth yesterday, but I'm sure it would have been a very good question for him as well, because um, if you like the FCC is uh, the kind of natural extension of the LHC, which Professor Bosworth works on and uses, if you like, conventional accelerator technology. In some sense, what I'm trying to do is um, is trying to get to these very high energies in a different way by using novel, novel acceleration technology so that we can get to these higher energies, hopefully, uh, hopefully with shorter accelerators and um, hopefully cheaper. Of course, it's not, um, it's not quite so easy. I mean, the FCC is, is really very high energies. And you know, certainly in novel acceleration, we're a long way from being able to demonstrate that's true. Even, of course, as a conventional accelerator, it's still a long way off because a lot of R&D is needed. As to whether the justification is sufficient, there is certainly no guarantee. There's, I guess the LHC had, um, is one of its big selling points was that it was looking for the Higgs particle. At the moment, you, there isn't anything like that for the FCC. However, it is going into, um, a new range, a new energy range where you don't know what's going on. And just as I'm showing, in a way, as I'm showing here, once you start to then go into this new energy range, you really don't understand um, what's happening. And you will definitely, uh, you know, measure physics in a completely unexplored region and how this relates, say, to cosmic rays. I mentioned something about, say, QCD and gravity, which I think is a very um, interesting thing, which these very high energy colliders can address, is that there's a there's lots of difficult mathematics behind um, the theory of uh, quantum chromodynamics. And there's a lot of difficult mathematics behind the theories of uh, gravitation. And you can use uh, a lot of the mathematics 
from QCD for gravitation and vice versa. And it's a question as to whether, is that actually just some nice mathematical trick or coincidence, or is there something really fundamental behind it? Maybe there is actually some intrinsic link, and you know, these are the kind of things you want to investigate or look for to say, try and you know, unify the forces. Uh, because at the moment, electromagnetism and the weak force are some sense, some sense the same, but can you actually unify the other forces? And as Professor Butterfield said yesterday, bring gravity into the standard model. Now, if you can then do these kind of investigations and make um, at these very high energies, maybe you can answer those kind of uh, questions. Thank you so much. Um, we are now, I know that there's still one more question in the chat, but we're actually going to go for a 10 minute break now. If you have any more questions, feel free to ask them on Slack. And Professor Matthew Wing, thank you so much for your time. This has been really interesting. Um, so yeah, we're gonna take a 10 minute break. You can either stay on the call or um, we will start with the next talk at 2 p.m. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much.